Hi, uh, I'm Lily Jen, and I'll be telling you about our studies of ion channels, and that's been a long-term collaboration uh, with Yunong Jen. Uh, this is the first of a two-part talk on ion channel studies. Uh, so for this part, I will start by giving some background on the ion channels and the way we went about identifying the channel molecule. And then uh, I will uh, tell you more about what we have learned about these ion channels. Uh, for a neuron to receive signals that impinge on its dendrites and then to generate an action potential uh, that propagates along the axon to the nerve terminals uh, to trigger transmitter release, uh, it relies on the function of a number of different channels that are distributed in different compartments of the cell. The dendrites, the axon initial segment, the nodes of round VA, and then the nerve terminals. Uh, molecular identification of a channel of interest makes it possible to generate reagents such as antibodies, and it also makes it possible to generate mutants with altered channel functions so that we can study the physiological contribution of this channel. Uh, Knowing the molecule that forms the channel also makes it possible to express the channel in Xenopus oocytes or other expression systems so we can study these channels one at a time and see how it works. For the first uh, attempt for molecular identification, uh, the channel of interest was voltage-gated potassium channels. These channels control the the waveform and the propagation of action potentials. Action potentials were recorded uh, nearly 70 years ago for the first time uh, from the squid giant axon. Uh, unlike mammalian uh, axons that can have myelination to speed up the propagation of action potentials, squid axons have no myelination and to speed up the propagation, some of the axons are very large, nearly one millimeter in diameter. In the 1950s, uh, Hodgkin and Huxley recorded from these squid giant axons uh, to provide the insight that action potential generation relies on the voltage-gated ion channels, uh, as we can see from this uh, schematic. The resting potential of a cell or the axon uh, is negative uh, on the inside, uh, typically uh, about minus 60 millivolts. And that is because uh, the resting cell is predominantly permeable to potassium ions. And in this diagram, uh, we have the blue channel to represent the potassium channel uh, that's active at rest. And when the signal comes uh, from presynaptic cells uh, to trigger transmitter release. Uh, this will activate the postsynaptic cell to generate an action potential. And uh, the first thing that happens uh, is the depolarization will open sodium channels, uh, shown here in red. And the uh, permeation of sodium ions will drive the membrane potential toward a positive value, uh, the, sodium equilibrium potential. And then the subsequent uh, activation of or opening of uh, voltage-gated potassium channels that's shown in green in this diagram will drive the membrane potential back down toward the potassium equilibrium potential. Uh, because a cell typically actually has many different kinds of potassium channels, the heterogeneity and low abundance of these potassium channels uh, has made it very difficult to purify these potassium channels uh, for the initial molecular study. And for this reason, uh, we took the approach of positional cloning that uh, in the, back in the 1980s was possible in the fruit fly because of the polytene chromosomes. Uh, these chromosomes in the larval salivary gland uh, has uh, very characteristic bending patterns. So if a gene can be mapped onto this chromosome, for example, by studying uh, mutations that's caused by chromosome translocations, 
and by analyzing the breakpoints uh, on a, a chromosome squash, as, as shown here. Uh, one could, in principle, start with a piece of DNA that's uh, near uh, the gene of interest, and by just uh, isolating overlapping uh, genomic uh, DNA fragments, uh, eventually reaching the gene of interest. Uh, so that form of positional cloning has been referred to as uh, chromosome walk. Knowing that shaker mutations cause uh, a symptom or the uh, phenotype that uh, is likely due to a deficit in potassium channels, uh, Diane Papazian, uh, Tom Schwartz, and Bruce Temple uh, used the chromosome walk uh, as the approach to clone shaker. Uh, it took six years uh, for the cloning uh, and validation of shaker as a potassium channel gene. But then it took just a few months uh, using the shaker uh, uh, DNA as the um, probe to isolate the ortholog in mammals. That's known as KV1.1. The high uh, evolutionary conservation uh, of these potassium channels also allowed the uh, identification of the the voltage-gated potassium channel in the squid axons. Uh, it is the ortholog of shaker. And uh, two different splice forms are, are expressed, uh, one in the giant axon and the other one in the small axons that are you know, surrounding the giant axon. The function of these voltage-gated potassium channels uh, is evolutionarily conserved. And we can see that from the phenotype. So starting with uh, two control wild-type flies put uh, to sleep uh, with ether anesthesia, we see that the flies only begin to move their legs when they were about to wake up. And that's very different from the shaker mutants that shake their legs and wings very vigorously uh, under ether anesthesia. Um, this uh, video was provided by John Edelman, uh, my colleague at uh, Volume Institute in Oregon. Uh, John also made video of a patient uh, with episodic type uh, ataxia type 1. And we see that uh, moderate levels of uh, physical activity will precipitate uh, the uncontrollable movement of the limbs uh, of this patient. The disease is caused by mutation of KV1.1 or KCNA1, uh, the human gene. And the uh, movement disorder can be uh, recapitulated in mouse models as well by mutating KV1.1. The basis uh, of this uh, uh, movement disorder uh, is the ability of KV1 to provide a break to control the propagation of action potential. Uh, by removing uh, KV1.1 with mutations, uh, there are rever uh, reverberant action potentials in the axon, and that results in hyperexcitability. In the mouse model, uh, we can see that uh, re stimulation of the motor axon just once will generate uh, reverberant uh, action potentials that can be recorded with uh, extracellular uh, electro place uh, near the muscle. In the fruit fly larvae, uh, we see the same thing, that the reverberant uh, action potentials can be recorded uh, from the motor axon with extracellular recording. And that can be seen uh, either in the mutant fly with mutation in the shaker gene, or in the wild type fly, uh, with the preparation treated to potassium channel blockers. Yeah. And so we see that the physiological function of these uh, potassium channels is evolutionarily conserved in both vertebrates and invertebrates. Uh, the high level of sequence similarity of different voltage-gated potassium channels made it uh, possible for our colleagues in the field uh, to isolate a large number of the family members. And some of the members are linked to diseases of the brain, uh, like epilepsy or episodic ataxia. Uh, 
and other uh, members are linked to disease of the heart, like uh, arrhythmia or atrial fibrillation. And still, other types of voltage-gated potassium channels, when mutated, will cause deafness. Uh, at the time, we already knew there are other types of potassium channels that are important for controlling heart rate or release of insulin. But it was not possible to use voltage-gated potassium channels as probe to isolate those channels. So it was necessary to try a different approach, uh, expression cloning. And so in this approach, uh, if uh, the channel, or for that matter, uh, other transport proteins of interest uh, can be identified uh, in oocytes. So if we start with a rich source and just inject pools of RNA from this rich source into Xenopus oocytes, uh, and recording from the oocytes uh, can reveal the, the function of these channels. Uh, we could keep on subdividing the cDNA library until we end up with single clones to find that one clone that will generate the channel activity. So that was the approach used by Yoshihiro Kubo uh, for expression cloning of KIR 2.1 or IRK1. Uh, that's a one of the founding members for the KIR, or inward rectifying potassium channel family. And we see that uh, the two different types of voltage, you know, the voltage-gated potassium channels and the inward rectifying potassium channels share a common pore design uh, that, for, uh, that includes two transmembrane segments. And what's different for the voltage-gated potassium channels uh, is uh, it, th these channels have an additional voltage sensor domain with four transmembrane segments and uh, multiple positively charged residues on the fourth transmembrane segment. Uh, for the inward rectifying potassium channel, uh, once uh, the different family members have been characterized, we see that this family does include the channel that's important for controlling insulin release. So loss of function mutation will cause a hypoglycemia of infancy, and gain of function mutation will cause neonatal diabetes. Uh, this has been explained uh, in detail uh, by my colleague Frances uh, Ashcroft in her iBiology talk. Uh, other members of this family uh, can cause uh, uh, when mutated, will cause periodic uh, paralysis, that's disease of the skeletal muscle, uh, hypertension, disease of the kidney, or arrhythmia, uh, disease of the heart. And uh, we see also uh, by now that besides uh, the animal kingdom, potassium channels are present in the plant, in bacteria, and also in viruses. In the plants, uh, depending on the uh, cell types that express a, a potassium channel, uh, there are different functions uh, that uh, have been found to depend on potassium channel activity. Uh, for example, uh, in the stomatopore, uh, the potassium channel activities uh, allow the pore to open or close, and that's by controlling the volume of the cell. And back to the animal kingdom, oh, well, before we get to the many, uh, animal uh, kingdom, uh, in bacteria, uh, potassium transporters and ion channels uh, are important for maintaining the turgor pressure. And uh, from the structure of this uh, uh, potassium channel from bacteria from E. coli, we can see uh, the channel has very similar design, uh, but it's formed by very, one large polypeptide that includes four repeats, uh, each one looking like the 2TM, the inward rectifier potassium channel, the pore domain. So now uh, in mammals, we see two di uh, three different designs. The 2TM in the middle uh, is the simplest design. It's the channel subunit that has just the pore domain. Uh, on the right, uh, it, 
or closer to me uh, is the, uh, what's called K2P channels. Uh, this has two of the 2TN motif linked together. And so uh, for the, the 2TN uh, uh, arrangement, there are four subunits coming together to form the channel. And for the K2P with four t uh, transmembrane segments, it takes two subunits to form the channel. And the voltage-gated potassium channels that contains both the pore domain and the voltage sensor domain uh, also are tetramers. And uh, we see for each of these uh, three different type of potassium channels, uh, in each family, there are multiple subfamilies. Uh, and for each subfamily, uh, there are several different uh, channel proteins, uh, proteins with very similar sequences. And the channel can be formed as homotetramers with four identical subunits or heterotetramers uh, with a similar but not identical subunits. And this mix and match of subunits uh, greatly increase the diversity of the channels that's found in vivo. So take the voltage-gated potassium channels. Uh, the pore is formed uh, by the four uh, pore domains of the four subunits. There's a domain swap. So the voltage sensor of one subunit packs against the pore domain of its neighboring subunit. And with the positive charges in the voltage sensor, it would detect membrane potential change. So when the inside of the cell becomes more positive, the voltage sensor is moving outwards uh, by the, driven by the voltage, and this triggers the opening of the channel. And in the pore domain, uh, in between the two transmembrane helices, there's a pore loop that comes close together in the tetrameric channel to form the selectivity filter. This allows the channel to be highly selective, to allow potassium ions, but not other ions, to go through. And uh, this uh, very similar structural design of potassium channels uh, with uh, slight differences in channel properties uh, are found in different components of a neuron, uh, in the dendrites, the soma, and the axons. And one uh, striking example is at the node of Ranvier, where we see at the node that's uh, marked in green in that micrograph, uh, there are voltage-gated sodium channels and a subset of voltage-gated potassium channels. But on either side, the juxtaparanodal region that's marked uh, in red in the micrograph, they, there's another set uh, of voltage-gated potassium channels. Uh, the different types of uh, potassium channels uh, uh, that's marked in red here uh, are structurally related uh, to uh, channels like the cyclonucleotide gated channel here and uh, the trip channel here. These have a similar design to the voltage gated potassium channels. They are not very dependent on voltage. They are not selective for potassium. They allow positively charged ions to go through. And they quite often are found in sensory neurons to mediate sensory transduction. And then we have the uh, voltage-gated sodium channels and calcium channels that have uh, four of the 6TM design, uh, four pseudo subunits linked together uh, in one large polypeptide. And that's the alpha subunit, the pore forming subunit for the sodium channel or calcium channel. Uh, in prokaryotes, uh, we can see already both uh, types, the 2TM and the 6TM. And we can see that with evolution, there's a massive uh, uh, div diversification uh, of even the same design, the 6TM, to have channels of different properties. And then we have uh, the, the 2TM strung together to form the K2P potassium channel. And we have the 6TM strung together uh, in two copies or four copies to form other channels. 
And there's also example of the poor domain uh, used upside down uh, in an inverted version. And that example is the glutamate receptor. So it's a ligand gated ion channel. Uh, and the ligand is the major transmitter glutamate. A binding of the, uh, this channel to glutamate uh, allow the channel to open. And uh, usually, it's uh, just positively charged ions that will go through these channels. And we can see that the pore domain uh, is upside down compared to the pore domain of the voltage-gated channels. So uh, we see that these uh, ion channels uh, serve a range of functions in sensory transduction, in action potential generation, and in synaptic transmission. And there are other functions uh, like volume regulation. I've given you one example for channels in the plant. And that's also true for animal cells. And by having different channels placed in different parts of the cell, like the leading edge and the, and the rear end of a migra migrating cell, it's also possible to have local volume regulation uh, that will allow the cell to move. Uh, and, and not leave, you know, be dragging its rear end. Uh, uh, and uh, Shi Huang, uh, who studied uh, medullary blastoma uh, a few years ago, has found uh, evidence for voltage-gated potassium channel, EAG2, to be involved uh, in the control of volume regulation that's important for proliferation and also migration of uh, these brain cancer cells. And after decades of study uh, of these channels, we continue to run into surprises uh, of functions that we didn't know anything before. Uh, this is one example. Uh, the megancephaly uh, mutant mice uh, arose spontaneously in the Jackson lab, actually in the 1980s. Uh, and by now, we know that uh, the mutation is in KV1.1 uh, to cause uh, loss of function of these voltage-gated potassium channels. Uh, and we can also see that the brain is much larger. That's why the name, uh, megancephaly. And this uh, enlarged brain still keeps on growing in the adulthood. So, that's kind of heavy. And so the mutant mice tend to take on a, a sitting posture uh, and holding up its tail to keep balance. Um, a recent study by Xu Bing Yan uh, using mosaic analysis has uh, revealed the function of this channel in the neuroprogenitor cells. So KV1.1 behaves as a break to restrain, to control the extent of uh, adult neurogenesis. Uh, just how a voltage-gated potassium channel uh, will control uh, the division and formation uh, of uh, adult neurons in the hippocampus uh, of the adult brain is one of those uh, open, intriguing questions that still uh, keep us busy. So, uh, for the uh, work I've uh, described uh, so far uh, in this first part of my talk, uh, Diane Papazian, Tom Schwartz, and Bruce Temple uh, worked on uh, the chromosome uh, walk uh, initially uh, to identify Shaker as the first voltage-gated potassium channel. Yoshihiro Kubo uh, relied on expression cloning to identify a founding member of the inward rectifier potassium channel. Uh, more recently, Xu Huang did a study of medullary blastoma to identify uh, the function of uh, another type of voltage-gated potassium channel in controlling uh, proliferation and, and metastasis. And Xu Bing Yan uh, did a mosaic analysis to find a role for KV1.1 in the adult neuroprogenitors. Uh, these studies of uh, ion channels uh, spanning nearly four decades has been a long uh, collaboration uh, with uh, Yunong Jen, and it's supported by Howard Hughes Medical Institute, NIH, uh, 
and various post uh, doctoral fellowships from Human Frontier, Damon Rainian, and also American uh, Diabetes Association. Thank you.